Janet. <laughs> I thought I would look for poems from my recent book release of past performance art shows. Uh, this is in the chapter 2038 series, chapter 48, volume 1 of shows in Chicago years ago. And so I've got things from three different shows. Of, you don't know the shows. This actual show was from the, it was called The Couple on the Floor, and it was at the library that was five blocks away from where I grew up. <laughs> Just so you know, the only chance I had to do something there, and this poem is called Looking for a Worthy Adversary. I've been looking for a worthy adversary, someone I could lock horns with, because although my life makes more sense when I'm alone, it's not nearly as interesting. I've been looking for a worthy adversary, someone I could battle to the death with. Because it can't be about love, you see. Love can't exist on the terms I demand. It's never that pure. I've been looking for a worthy adversary, and so I slither up to you like a snake as you sit there at the corner and I tempt you with a golden apple. But all I was offering you is fruit from the tree of knowledge. I, I didn't know how willing you were to take from that fruit, from that tree. I, I'm not used to that, you know. And I didn't know you'd have a thing or two to teach me, too. Because as I've been looking for a worthy adversary, all this time I've been playing a part, an actress on a stage, spouting lines on cue. And that role was getting tiresome, but those stage lights still came on night after night, and I still had to play my part. Until on my night off, I saw your performance at the theater down the street. And you know, your protagonist was doing what I was doing, right down to faking it with people who don't matter, right down to going home and still feeling empty. And you know, I like to see that boiling emotion underneath that no one else could see, because only I had the knowledge to know what that emotion really means. And I'm beginning to wonder if we could get together and write our own play. It would be a masterful performance, and as that curtain would close, we'd hold each other's hands and walk off the stage, and the audience would know there was a happy ending. And now, when I walk on on the set, and there you stand in front, stage left, I, I wait for my move to my cue to make my move. None of the rest of the scene matters to me, you know. Maybe they'd like our little play. Maybe they wouldn't. Who really cares? Because even though I came to you and tempted you, you now tempt me and tease me and torment me and tell me everything that I was too afraid to believe and show me the knowledge that had always escaped me. <laughs> and when you talk, you reach your hand into my brain and you pull out my thoughts and you shove them into your mouth and you spit them back at me again. And instead of filling me with terror, it fills me with joy. I've been looking for a worthy adversary, and maybe you are so much more than that. Because now every day is Valentine's Day, and now it's like candy and flowers and springtime and hearts and cupids and sunshine, and you know, it's scary. These cliches are actually beginning to make sense. So now my performance of a lifetime is made, and I stand here like a statue and wait for my applause. And as I wait for the reviews on the performance I was made for, I know what they're all going to say, and none of that matters anymore. Because I know what you are going to say. Because it's everything I want to say. And because now it's time for you to take my thoughts again and shove them into your mouth again and spit them back at me again. For I wait for you to come on stage again for our next wonderful performance where we have our happy endings where you tell me what I already know. Actually, a very tiny portion of that poem I read during your wedding. <laughs> there you are, you, there you stand, you know, that, that little person, I, I read part of the wedding, so I'm like, yay, first of that, I guess. Um, this is from another show. This was from something that was called Death and Rebirth. Um, it was at Loyola Beach, and it was called that because it was on the anniversary of the day that I was almost killed in an auto accident. And so there's, there was bad stuff in it and good stuff in it. And I guess this relates because this was written 
I believe, three days before that accident. It's called Fantastic Car Crash. And our life is one big road trip now. And we set the cruise control, we make our way down the expressway. And most of the time, we're just moving the straight line and the scenery blurs, that there's nothing to see. But I know what's inside of you, and I know what you're made of. I, I know there is no such thing as a calm with you. You are a fantastic car crash. You stop traffic in both directions as the gapers gawk and the delay grows as they all slow down to stare. Everything shatters with you, you know. It's a spectacular explosion. I try to duck and cover as metal flies through the air. And every time you leave the scene of the accident, I'm left picking up the shards of glass from the broken windows. You know, the glass breaks into such tiny little pieces. They look like ice. It takes so long to pick up the pieces, and even though I'm careful, I'm still picking up the pieces, and I'm still on my knees, and the glass cuts into my hands, and the blood drips down to the street. Think of it as my contribution to this fantastic car crash that is you, that is me, that is us. As I pull the glass from my hands and wave my hand at the line of traffic, Go on, keep driving. This happens all the time. There's nothing to see here. It was, it was about a relationship. And they started a journal while I was in a coma for people that were visiting. The first one was from my roommate, and he's like, you just wrote a poem, Fantastic Car Crash, and it was, it's supposed to be me. In this crash, not you. What? I don't know what. Hey, which is just—it was just a weird, weird thing that I happened to write that right before him. Um, but actually, from that same show, is a portion of a poem called "How Do I Explain It." There are so many times when I've had so little hope, and maybe that is my problem, not yours. And maybe this is. And the thing is, people keep trying to tell me that they're always, that this is the hard part. But, and maybe I have been through so much, haven't I gone through enough? How do I explain what I go through? How, how do I feel? How, how, do I, how do I explain it? But now, with you, you remind me that there is meaning in this world. Maybe you are a marine and can hold your own. Though, through Asian arts and two black belts, there's also you've also learned how to keep that violence to be never is to actually ever actually be the answer. And still, you carry my stuff for me, which should piss off the feminist in me because I know that I've gone through so much. But I want to think that I am not a poor, helpless girl. But you help me remember what it's like where the grass is greener and. I can see that silver lining now. And when all the references to growing grass, strolls on the beach at sunset, four-leaf clovers, rainfo rainbows, don't quite cut it. When you make me feel this way, I wonder if I can explain what I go through. How do I feel? How do I explain it? <laughs>